Thank you. There is a town in southern Iraq's Maysan province that you've probably never heard of. The town's 35,000 people go about their lives much like you or I. They go to the market. They meet with friends over a meal or a cup of thick black tea. They talk the latest gossip. They have hopes for the future and they dream at night. It's how life has been there for generations. The town's name is Majar al-Kabir. On the 24th of June, 2003, six British Army Royal Military Police Red Caps entered the town to begin the task of rebuilding the local police station and training recruits to fill it. After the brief war to destroy the infrastructure in the area, these would have been the first steps back to normality. At about 10 a.m. that day, they arrived in the town and they were greeted warmly. For about 30 minutes, they shared tea with the town elders and they talked about the best way to return to effective policing after the destruction of Saddam's ruling Ba'ath Party. This was a simple mission. This wasn't going to be a hard assignment. Military intelligence had evaluated the town and they assessed it as low risk and benign. So low risk and so benign, in fact, that the Red Caps were only carrying 50 rounds of ammunition down from the normal 600 bullets that each one of them would carry. And they'd been provided only with emergency radios that were antiquated and too bulky to carry. Despite this assessment of low risk, by midday, just two hours after arriving in the town, all six soldiers had been murdered. Shot dead, huddled in the back room of the police station that they'd come to rebuild by a mob armed with automatic weapons. So, this event affected me deeply. At the moment they were huddling in that room, being surrounded by a murderous crowd, I was also in southern Iraq. I was a captain in the British Army, serving in the same province serving in the same brigade as the Red Caps. After the war fighting is finished, I was carrying out the role of a military intelligence officer. I met and I served with each one of the six Red Caps. So of course, as you can imagine, I asked myself, how? How could this possibly happen when we've been so sure and so confident that the risk was low? How could things end up like this? And initially, I came to the conclusion that we just got it wrong. We missed something. Or we made a tragic miscalculation. We didn't understand the area or the people as well as we thought. But even with the advantage of hindsight, I couldn't find that thing that we'd missed. I couldn't find what we'd overlooked or misunderstood. And standing here, in front of you, 13 years later, I can still tell you that the risk of an armed mob turning on a team of British soldiers who'd gone there to help them to rebuild was low. No question. And even if an angry crowd had congregated, then they would have told the soldiers to leave and told them to never come back. To us, there was no way they would have been killed. So, in my soul searching, in my questioning, and in my seeking to understand, I had a realization. And I realized that we hadn't got it wrong. I realized that tragically we'd got it right, but we'd got it right using a completely flawed system. And that flawed system was the conformity that we followed in us using the system of risk. For as long as people have been around, risk has been our way of dealing with danger. You do it today. 
all the time. Let's call this the version one risk operating model. Devised at a time when things were simple, when we lived in caves and everything was out there trying to kill us, whether it be a saber-toothed tiger or a woolly mammoth. So we had to look at everything and stack them up to understand which one was most likely to come knocking today so that we could do something about it. Only this way could we survive. But with today's complexities, with the challenges that we face, and the speed of human interaction, this model that we've been conforming to for generations is no longer relevant. We need to upgrade from version one risk operating model to a new version two. So, and this is really important kind of for everything that I'm going to go, go forward talking about now. Version one risk is the concept of risk that we all understand, we use every day, and that has been around for generations. Version two is something different, a new and updated model. Reg Key's son, Tom, was one of the red cats murdered in the Jar al Kabir that day. Tom was murdered just four days before his 21st birthday. In his letters and phone calls home, Reg remembers that his son didn't talk about risk. Reg remembers that his son spoke about feeling acutely aware and uncharacteristically disturbed by his own vulnerability. In the Jar al Kabir, under version one risk operating model, as I've said, there was no question that it was low risk. But any British soldier in that town, with only 50 rounds of ammunition, and no protection, and no chance of backup, was without question exceptionally vulnerable. If instead of looking at the risk and trying to figure out if something could go wrong, we focused on vulnerability and threats, would those six team members have ever gone into that town alone, without body armor, with no protection, and with no support? And it's not just in situations as tragic, life-threatening, or immediate as war, where this is true. We see the version one risk operating model being used completely inadequately to try and control today's complex threats. <laughs> Kueko Adeboli was a London-based trader when his three-year scam cost the UBS bank one and a half billion US dollars in 2011. When he was released from prison earlier this year, he said that if banks continue to chase the same level of profitability as in the past, then the only way to generate these profits is to take more risk. To put it another way, banks remain cripplingly vulnerable to rogue traders, despite all the controls that they put in place, because they're happy to accept and are complacent around risk. Okay. Now, I do have a small job for you uh, today. Now, I know you weren't expecting this um, as the audience, and I understand that it's, you're, it's a high-pressure role you got there. You know, sat there doing good audiencing, everybody's eyes on you. So don't worry, I'm going to keep it really, really simple and straightforward. What I want you to do is to write down or even if that's too much of a challenge, just think about your favorite color. Okay? Okay. Nice and simple. So I was just talking about how banks surround themselves with risk, despite the known history with road traders and the 2008 crash. So let's compare the bank's version one approach to Google and Facebook. 
Google and Facebook embrace version 2 and actively seek out vulnerabilities. In May this year, Facebook paid a 10-year-old boy from Finland 10,000 US dollars because he identified a vulnerability in Instagram that made it possible for hackers to delete the comments from other users. Currently, Google has 100,000 US dollars up for grabs if you can hack Chromebook software and expose its vulnerabilities. Google and Facebook aren't looking at the risk of hacking. They're using version 2 to actively seek out how it's vulnerable to being hacked. Under version 1 risk operating model, what we try and do is we try to calculate likelihood and then we use it to prioritize risks or to satisfy ourselves that they're controlled. Casinos and banks use the law of large numbers to understand likelihood and then to set favorable odds. If a game is based on the toss of a coin, the likelihood of the coin landing on heads or tails is completely objective and it can't be influenced by human behavior. Over time, you toss the coin a million times, it will land 50% heads and 50% tails. And in some bad news for all you professional gamblers here, with a payout of less than two to one, the house will win. That's why a casino has a chandelier and not a strip light. <laughs> but unlike a, unlike a coin, people are unpredictable and inconsistent. What makes the world an amazing place? full of diversity, full of challenge, and full of excitement. But trying to apply the law of large numbers to volatile, subjective human behavior is fundamentally flawed, surely. And yet this is what we do on the version one risk management operating system. Okay, so, favorite color, remember? A tough assignment for you. So I'm looking for a few volunteers to, to show me or shout out what their favorite color is. So somebody from kind of like this side here. Blue. Blue. Greenish blue. That's <laughs> white specific. Yeah. Okay. Isn't it kind of like the middle? Black. Black. You're dressed fully in black. Yeah. And this side? Red. Red. Very good. Yellow, somebody said. Is there a different version of blue? Milky blue. Is that even a thing? And somebody from the back? Turquoise. Say again? Turquoise. Turquoise. Wow, sophisticated, sophisticated part of the audience here. So, using version 1.0 risk operating system is a bit like asking you all to agree on a collective favorite color. You've got completely diverse opinions based on your personal taste, your natural biases, your upbringing, your culture, your history, your recent experiences, or whatever. And yet, this is what we try to do with our version 1 risk operating model. Under version 1 operating, what we try to do is we try to neatly put risk into a box, whereas what we should be doing is climbing out of the box and going hunting for vulnerabilities. Using the version 1.0 risk operating system for anything involving nature or people is flawed. In the 1960s, a version 1 risk assessment at the soon to be built Fukushima nuclear power plant defined that it needs to be able to withstand the force of a 19 foot tsunami. Of course, in 2011, a 46 foot tsunami came and swamped the plant and show the world how vulnerable a nuclear reactor could be. In 2003, NASA used a version one risk assessment to approve and authorize a damaged Columbia shuttle to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Tragically, all seven crew members were killed when the vulnerability in the heat-proof shield on Columbia's wing led to it disintegrating on re-entry over Texas and Louisiana. So on each occasion, in those two examples, 
Version 1 thinking fell short. And although each event, the tsunami and the disintegration of a space shuttle, was exceptionally low risk, Columbia and Fukushima proved to be heartbreakingly vulnerable. Version 2.0, the vulnerability model, is a healthy paradox. Because to focus on vulnerability, we have to have a deep sense of paranoia built on a foundation of care. So it's care and paranoia. So it's like caranoia, right? Okay, thanks. <laughs> see what I did there, right? Caranoia. From caranoia, we seek out vulnerabilities. And from the vulnerabilities that we find, it drives our caranoia, completing the circle on our version 2 vulnerability operating system. Version 1 risk management operating system is a dangerous paradox. Because the more we focus on risk, the more we surround ourselves with risk. And the more we surround ourselves with risk, the more comfortable we become. So we need to move away from our preoccupation with risk. Just like on the dusty streets of Majar Al Kabir in 2003, it gives us a false sense of comfort. And for anything more subjective than the toss of a coin, it's completely flawed. We need to challenge conformity. We need to move to a version two vulnerability model and take our vulnerabilities and drive our natural paranoia. Thank you.